now, like me, all of you must be very eager to listen to Honorable Justice Ruma Khan. In this context, I feel tempted to recall what Winston Churchill had once said about a fanatic. A fanatic is a person who won't change his mind and can't change the subject either. With that, I would just give uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Justice Rubapal the no introduction, but yet, just to refresh your memory, I'll just go through a brief biodata because such illustrious career life cannot be explained in few words. I would make an attempt to mention a few salient aspects. She was awarded, she is a, a BA Honours LLB BCL at Oxford, was awarded the Motilal Nehru Gold Medal for getting a first class first in LLB examination, was the president of the Rally Club at Oxford, was an editor of the African Law Reports at Oxford. Started practice as a lawyer in 1968 on the civil side, elevated as a judge to the High Court of Calcutta in 1990. Elevated as a judge on the Supreme Court of India in January 2000. She retired in June 2006. Participated in several international seminars in Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Pakistan, Nepal, Manila, Chiang Mai in Thailand, Rome, Ottawa, and Yale. Have given lectures in various parts of India, headed a direct contact submission to Cambodia on behalf of the International Labor, or Labor, or Labor Organization. She, she was the Executive Chairperson of the National Legal Services Authority, Chairperson of the Academic Council, Indian Law Institute, Executive Council Member of the National Judicial Academy and West Bengal National University of Juridical Sciences and Chairperson of the Museum Committee of the Supreme Court. At present, she is <laughs> advisor to the Asia-Pacific Forum on Equality Issue, Executive Council Member of the Commonwealth Human Rights Initiative, Member of the Committee of Experts on the application of conventions. Um, I would like to thank all the persons on behalf of the podcast who have invited me here, not only the chairman, but also the various officers who went to see me and uh, invited me to participate in this function. I accept the invitation uh, with uh, alacrity and uh, because it gave me an opportunity of speaking about a subject which I feel uh, is very relevant and in respect of which I hold a very strong view and I, I, I think there's nothing like having a captive audience of getting one's own point of view across. Um, of course, after the um, brilliant speech of previous speaker, I feel a little doubtful as to how, uh, uh, how successful I will be in putting my point of view across. Uh, but I will try my best. And my reason for choosing this particular topic, of course, is of the increasing importance of the concept of secularism in the context of the present day violent communalism in almost every state across the country. As everyone knows, India has five main faiths, namely Hinduism, which legally includes six Jains and Buddhists. Then we have Islam, we have Christianity, Zoroastrianism, and Judaism. Historically, and even after independence, communal conflict has to a greater or lesser degree existed between some of these faiths. In fact, there has often been conflict between subdivisions of these faiths. For example, between uh, factions of the Syrian Christian church, or between Sunnis and Sh Shias as far as Islam is concerned, or between the different 
uh, sects of Hindus, between different sects of Sikhs. Uh, the the Dera Sakcha Sada very recently is, a, is an illustration of that. So we have had communal clashes right through. But with every riot, every bombing, indeed every act of communal violence, the cohesive fabric of this country undergoes a severe strain. Unfortunately, democracy inevitably brings in vote bank politics. And political leaders taking advantage of such situations fan the fear and distrust which may strengthen their vote base but which weakens the nation. It is doubly unfortunate because India was meant to be a secular country. Although the word secular was added to the preamble of the Constitution only in 1976 by the 42nd Amendment, it was always a part of the constitutional philosophy. And yet, 60 years after independence, according to an opinion poll which was conducted by a television channel, 82% of all Indians believe that India is at present more divided along communal lines than ever before. It has therefore become necessary to revisit and assess the constitutional framework on the basis of which this country was founded and exists as one nation. The subject of secularism is multifaceted, whether seen from the political, philosophical, or legal points of view. I have limited myself to a legal appraisal of the concept in India with reference to two areas only, namely the issues of a uniform civil code and conversion. The word secular, broadly defined, means worldly, as distinguished from spiritual. It can also mean no particular religious affiliation. However, in the political context, it can and has assumed different meanings in different countries, depending broadly on historical and social circumstances, the political philosophy, and the felt needs of a particular community. In one country, the word may mean an actively negative attitude of the state to all religious and, and religious all religions and religious institutions. For example, the First Amendment, the American Constitution, prohibits the making of any law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. So in other words, no law can be passed in America with regard to anything which is even remotely religious. The clause against establishment of religion by law was intended to erect a wall of separation between the church and the state. The Australians have adopted a similar approach. However, under the Indian constitution, there is no such wall of separation between the state on the one hand and religious religion on the other. In India, the state is secular in that there is no official religion. India is not a theocratic state. In fact, Article 15.1 of the constitution prohibits the state from discriminating against any citizen on the grounds only of religion, race, caste, sex, place of birth. However, the Constitution does envisage the involvement of the state in matters associated with religion and religious institutions, and even indeed with the practice, profession, and propagation of religion in its most limited and distilled meaning. Article 16 recognizes the validity of laws relating to management of religious and denominational institutions by the state. Article 28 contemplates the state itself managing institutions in which religious instruction is to be given. Although like other secular governments, the Indian constitution provides for freedom of conscience and the individual's right to freely profess, practice, and propagate religion. Nevertheless, the right is expressly subject to 
public order, morality, and health, and two other fundamental rights guaranteed under the Constitution. In India, therefore, the word secular means an involvement of the state with religious matters, but with, without discrimination. Nevertheless, the common and basic meaning given to the word secular state in all countries is keeping religion away from politics. The political philosophy of separation of church and state has been developed in the West in the historical context of the preeminence of the established church and the exercise of power by it over society and its institutions. The democratic state gradually replaced and marginalized the influence of the church. Although the word secularism may have been borrowed in the Indian constitution from the West, the concept of a secular state in India is not new. Akbar laid the foundations of secularism and religious neutrality of the state, which he insisted must ensure that no man should be interfered with on account of religion, and anyone is to be allowed to go over to a religion that pleases him. However, the unique brand of secularism provided in the Indian constitution was developed in the historical background of freedom struggle and the conflict between one, the one nation as opposed to the two nation doctrine, followed by the fracture of partition. The framers of the constitution wanted to ensure the perpetuation of the one nation doctrine to distinguish it from the theocratic state of Pakistan and to reassure the minorities, one, that parliament would not only not impose any religion, but would also ensure freedom of religion amongst all Indian people, and two, that all religious communities would be treated equally. Secularism is a recognized constitutional goal and is a part of the basic structure of the constitution, which cannot be amended by ex in exercise of the powers of amendment granted to parliament under Article 368 of the constitution. It is a facet of the right to equality, which is a cement which holds the citizens of this country together. Part three of the Constitution deals with fundamental rights. Amongst the rights which are treated as fundamental are articles 14 to 18, which deal expressly with the right to equality. Articles 25 to 28, which guarantee right to freedom of religion, which right is a facet of the right of equality as I have said before, is subject to public order, morality, and health. In other words, the state may make laws subject to which a religion may, uh, in fact, be practiced or propagated. The state is also empowered to make any law regulating or restricting any economic, financial, political, or other secular activity which may be associated with religious practice with the object of bringing about a uniformity and equalization of the rights and obligations of the people, thereby minimizing differences in areas which do not interfere with any religion. As a result, courts have upheld laws which may regulate or restrict matters associated with religious practices, if such practice does not form an integral part of a particular religion. The decision of the question as to whether a certain practice is a religious practice or not may present difficulties because sometimes practices, religious and secular, are so mixed up and it is difficult to differentiate between because what is religion to one is superstition to another. But the courts have been called upon and have decided issues raised irrespective of the religion in question. A few recent examples will suffice. When a non brahmin was appointed to perform pujas in a temple in Kerala, this was challenged by some Hindus saying, the appointment was challenged by saying that it was against the religious practice of Hindus and that it violated their uh, freedom under Article 25 of the Constitution, freedom of religion, 
and that only Brahmins could perform the job of sutras. The Supreme Court, however, said that any custom or usage, irrespective or even any proof of their existence in pre-constitutional days, cannot be countenanced as a source of law to claim any rights when it is found to violate human rights, dignity, social equality, and the specific mandate of the Constitution and law made by Parliament, namely equality. So they upheld the appointment, and the uh, uh, person who was appointed, the non brahmin who was appointed to perform, uh, who does that appointment was upheld. As far as Islam is concerned, uh, there was a law which was uh, it had come up in fact in, in Bengal, where uh, the uh, law had forbidden uh, the slaughter of a cow on Buck Eve, and the, it was uh, taken up before the uh, Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court said it is not a part of the, of the religious requirement for a Muslim that a cow must necessarily be sacrificed for earning religious merit on bhakti. Similarly, it has been held that the performance of a Tandav dance by the Anand Margis is not part of their religion and therefore could be controlled. And no community, with irrespective of the faith, no sect of any community, can claim a right to act to noise pollution on the ground of religion, whether by beating of drums or reciting prayers by use of microphones and loudspeakers so as to disturb the peace or tranquility in the neighborhood. I, coming so soon after the pujas, I wonder how much of this is in fact implemented. So are personal laws a part of religion? Or does the state have the power to regulate them through legislation? Without making any value judgment, and going strictly by the law as it stands today, the answer to this is in the affirmative. In other words, the state does have the power to regulate personal laws. The constitution itself envisages homogeneity to be brought about in respect of all aspects of civil law applicable to all Indians. And Article 44 says the state shall endeavor to secure for the citizens a uniform civil code throughout the territory of India. In fact, except for marriage, divorce, adoption, and succession, these four aspects, all other aspects of personal civil law are covered by statutes which apply to all Indians irrespective of their faith. For example, contract. For example, uh, transfer of property. Uh, landlord and tenant and every other aspect, service law, applies to all irrespective of uh, their faith. It is only these four aspects of marriage, divorce, adoption, and succession where there is a distinction. Laws relating to marriage, inheritance, and adoption cannot be said to be part of a religion. However, sacred the source may be believed to be. It has been suggested with some force that the issue is really one of gender because it has been invariably found that in all these personal laws, the distinction which has really been drawn is relates to women, women's right to divorce, women's right to inheritance, women's right to adopt, and so forth. Whatever the reason for exclusion of the personal laws, limited only to these four aspects, it is not a question of the parliament not having the constitutional power to enact laws to regulate this, but it's a political question of political expediency. At present, the laws relating to these three subjects are governed by the personal laws of different faiths. For example, we have the Hindu Marriage Act of 1935, the Muslim Law Sharia Application Act of 1937, the Parsi Marriage and Divorce Act of 1936, the Christian Marriage Act of 1872, and the Indian Divorce Act of 1869. All of them deal specifically with different faiths. Article 25 itself does not speak of personal laws of any religious denomination. On the other hand, it contains a clause giving power to the state, as I have said, 
to regulate all secular activities that may be associated with religious practice. To a large extent, in fact, uniformity has already been brought about within the different faiths. Hindus, as a believer, Hindu will know, uh, we had, broadly speaking, two main uh, uh, um, sets of personal laws, the Mitakshara and the Dayabhag. All this was brought under one, uh, one uh, body or an, one umbrella by the Hindu code bill. Uh, there are, of course, we have laws of inheritance in Kerala, which are different from the laws of inheritance in the rest of the country. We have we have specific laws of inheritance. We have matriarchy as for as opposed to patrilineal, patrilineal form of succession elsewhere. And uh, the other thing that India also brought about was, of course, the change in um, marriage laws. Uh, the Sharia Act similarly removed the differences between the different sects of Muslims, between Shia, Shias and Sunni. And we had the Khoja and the Kachi remnants of Gujarat who followed the Hindu uh, law of succession, as opposed to the Malsan Muslims uh, who had a different form of inheritance altogether. All that was brought in under one umbrella by the Sharia Act. Uh, similarly, under the strict Hanafi law, there was a provision, uh, uh, there was no provision which en enabled a Muslim woman to obtain a decree dissolving her marriage on the failure of the husband to maintain her. So there was a law which was uh, passed uh, in 1939, which was called the Dissolution of the Muslim Marriage Act, which gave her that right, although the, her own personal law did not provide for it. The Christian Marriage Act similarly applies equally to the various sects of all Christians. Therefore, the process of uniformity within the main faiths has long since started. The British, of course, wanted uniformity in civil law because it helped them administer the country more easily. For the framers of the Constitution, a uniform civil code meant a shared identity and a deletion of differences leading to national integration. Civil rights activists support the uniform civil code because they expect a more equal society where the vulnerable, oppressed, and marginalized members are given their rightful place. Unfortunately, the controversy has taken on a communal hue. A uniform civil code is resisted by the Muslim community as the seen as an attempt by Hindu fundamentalists to take away their cultural identity and survival. The distrust is heightened by the insistence of the Hindu fundamentalists <coughs> on a uniform civil code to eliminate the so-called special privileges of pampered minorities. But as I see it, uniformity in personal laws does not mean the imposition of any particular personal law of a particular faith, but the adoption of best practices, so to speak, of the different personal laws. The purpose of law in rural societies is not the progressive assimilation of the minorities in the majoritarian media. This does not solve the problem, and it would be impossible to resolve the issue. But if it is seen as a conglomeration of the best practices of all religions, then I think it would resolve a lot of the dispute. Courts have on various occasions urged the adoption of the Uniform Civil Code, not out of any political or religious bias, but because the Constitution mandates that the freedom of conscience and the right to freely profess, practice, and propagate religion is subject to the fundamental rights including the all-important right of equality. I will conclude this part of the talk with three illustrations of how the courts have been able to achieve this in some measure. We are familiar with the case of Shah Banu. Shah Banu was married to an advocate. She married him in 1932. There were five children born of this marriage, three sons and two daughters. Forty-three years later, she was driven out of her home. She applied for maintenance under Section 125 of the Criminal Procedure Code. For those of you who are not familiar with Section 125, 
Section 125 provides that if any person having sufficient means neglects or refuses to maintain his wife and uh, also aged parents, but I'm leaving aged parents out, maintain his wife, and if the wife is unable to maintain herself, a magistrate of the first class may, upon proof of such neglect or refusal, order such person to make a monthly allowance for the maintenance of his wife at such monthly rent not exceeding 500 rupees per month. The magistrate in Shahbanu's case gave her 125 rupees. No, sorry, not 125, but 25 rupees per month. Director, this advocate who must be earning handsome amounts to pay only 25 rupees. Uh, Shahbanu was not satisfied. She appealed to the High Court. The High Court raised the sum to 179 rupees. Uh, the husband, of course, as soon as she made the application for maintenance, uh, divorced his wife by uh, pronouncing talaq three times. Uh, as against the High Court's decision to uh, directing him to give 179 rupees, um, the husband, he, he appealed to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court dismissed his appeal and said, that the right given to a woman under section 125 was there irrespective of the personal law of the parties concerned. And that was a mistake. Because, and totally unnecessary, because the Supreme Court could have rested its judgment on the second limb. Namely, they found that there was, in fact, no difference between section 125 or the right of a woman under section 125 and the Muslim personal law. But because the Supreme Court had said that 125 would prevail irrespective of the personal law in question, there was an absolute total uproar. Human rights activists, of course, were very happy because they said that women had been at last, long last, been granted some relief. But the Muslim community saw it as an encroachment on their identity. And this led, as you all remember, to Rajiv Gandhi's government enacting the Muslim Women Protection of Rights of Divorce Act of 1986, which, according to everyone, and I'm sure many of you here thought, that Shahbanu was in fact reversed, and that a Muslim woman can no longer get maintenance under Section 125 of the Act. Now, the Act itself was challenged that the 1986 Shah Rajiv Gandhi's Act was challenged before the Supreme Court by a Muslim gentleman called Daniel Latifi, one of the very liberal uh, intellectual thinkers of our day. And when he came up before the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court said, no, 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 we are not going to set aside the Act at all. It is perfectly constitutional. Why? Because they said we have to interpret the Act having regard to basic human rights, culture, dignity, and the decency of life, and dictates of necessity in the pursuit of social justice. And they said, these are the values which we will have to decide this issue and interpret the law. And having so interpreted the law in the light of basic human rights and so forth, it in effect reaffirmed the decision in section, uh, uh, in the Shahbanu's case by holding that what could be granted by the magistrate under section 125 can now be granted under the, 108, uh, under the new act of Rajiv Gandhi's act. So in other words, the status quo ante prior to the 1986 act has in fact been again done. There has been no repercussion to this at all. And now a Muslim woman can still and does. There are several decisions following Latifi's case where uh, uh, Muslim women who have been thrown out of their husband's house have asked for and obtained maintenance for as long as they remain unmarried or unable to maintain themselves. The second example uh, where the courts have moved towards the Uniform Civil Code relates to Christianity. A Christian lady had asked for divorce and they found that the Indian Divorce Act which only applies to Christians did not have divorce by mutual consent. And uh, so the court said that surely the time has 
now come for a complete reform of the law of marriage and to make a uniform law applicable to all people irrespective of religion or caste. It appears to be necessary to introduce irretrievable breakdown of marriage and mutual consent as grounds for divorce in all cases. Incidentally, irretrievable uh, breakdown of marriage and divorce by mutual consent is not available under the Hindu Marriage Act either. It is only available under the Special Marriage Act, which is applicable to all Indians irrespective of their faith, provided you are registered under the Special Marriage Act. But they said that in, uh, it was necessary in that particular case as far as Christians were concerned and directed that a copy of the order be forwarded to the Ministry of Law and Justice for action. And action was taken by the Ministry of Law and Justice and within a few years the Indian Divorce Amendment Act was introduced in, uh, and uh, passed by Parliament introducing divorce by mutual consent into the Christian law. The third is a similar case, but again dealing with Hindus, where the Hindu Marriage Act, as I said, irretrievable breakdown of marriage and divorce by mutual consent was not, are not grounds. But nevertheless, the, uh, uh, the Supreme Court granted the divorce because they said the marriage has been wrecked beyond the hope of salvage. Public interest and the interest of all concerned lies in the recognition of the fact and to de declare defunct, de jure, what is already defunct, de facto. To keep the sham is obviously conducive to immorality and potentially more, prejudice, more prejudicial to the public interest than dissolution of a marriage bond. This decision was given in very recently, in fact, in 2006. And the Supreme Court in this case uh, has also recommended to the Union of India to seriously consider bringing an amendment in the Hindu Marriage Act to incorporate irretrievable breakdown of marriage from ground to ground of divorce. A copy of the judgment has also been directed to be sent to the Secretary of Ministry of Law and Justice to take appropriate steps. Now, let us see what happens to this particular directive of the Supreme Court. But as observed in Shravanu's case, it is the state which is charged with the duty of securing a uniform civil code for the citizens of the country. And unquestionably, it has the legislative competence to do so. Piecemeal attempts, of course, to bridge the gap between personal laws cannot take place in uh, cannot take the place of a common uh, uniform civil code. Justice to all is far more satisfactory way of dispensing justice than justice from case to case. It is also doubtful that the goal of uniformity can be left to ideas and interpretations of individual judges where varying attitudes may dictate the outcome. This brings me to the second aspect of secularism, and that is the topic of conversions. This year we have seen incident after incident of communal clashes, whether in Maharashtra, Karnataka, Orissa, or Andhra Pradesh. Communal clashes have taken place in the past for various reasons. But the communal clashes this year has been initiated by Hindu fundamentalists on the grounds that Hindus were being converted possibly to Christianity. Article 25 secures to every person, as I have said, subject to public order, health and morality, a freedom not only to entertain religious belief, but also to propagate or disseminate his ideas for the edification of others. What the article grants is not the right to convert. It has given the right to be converted. I have the right to be converted, but I do not have the right to convert. There is no fundamental right available to someone to convert someone else to one's own religion. The only right that I have over others is I can transmit or spread my religion by the exposition of the tenets of my religion. Several, several states have in fact enacted legislation to prevent conversion by force, fraud or allurement, making such conversion a punishable offense. 
such statutes have been upheld, being constitutionally valid by the Supreme Court, on the ground that forcible conversions would impinge on the freedom of conscience guaranteed to all citizens of the country alike. And secondly, if an attempt is made to raise communal passions, for example, on the ground that someone has forcibly converted to another religion, it would in all probability give rise to an apprehension of a breach of public order affecting the community at large. The judgment has been widely criticized because the Supreme Court did not consider the legislative history of Article 25 and because no distinction was drawn between conversion by force and conversion by persuasion. The fact, for example, that neither Islam nor Buddhism nor Christianity have a caste system may be a reason why many Dalits prefer any one of those religions over Hinduism. Would this come within the, uh, within the word allurement? The fact that I do not have a caste system may induce me to become a Buddhist or may induce me to, to take, uh, become a Christian. But would the Christians then be guilty of using it as an allurement? But that is part of their religion. That was not clarified by the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court also glossed over the issue by treating the question of conversion as a law and order problem, irrespective of the circumstances in which conversion takes place. Now, if I have, we have had a very famous singer, uh, folk singer, who has uh, been converted to Islam. We have had a, a very famous uh, a film actor from Hollywood, Richard Gere, who has given up Christianity and become a Buddhist. So you can't treat every conversion as a law and order problem. So I think the Supreme Court was wrong. And it also appears to me that the Supreme Court should have emphasized that the word conversion also covers the word reconversion. Because reconversion is taking place, the so-called reconversion is taking place on a mass basis throughout the country, accompanied very often by violence. The Supreme Court has recently, of course, maybe the Supreme Court may have clarified the issue because it has recently upheld a ban on Dr. Praveen Togaria, restraining him from entering a district in Karnataka and from participating in any function for a period of 15 days because the administration in Karnataka found that there were several instances where on account of his speeches and his actions, there were communal clashes and the district administration had to intervene to avoid disturbances of social tranquility and communal harmony. Therefore, secularism in the Indian context means an equal status for all religions and equality for all religions means that faith in one's own religion must not detract from respect for other religions. If that be so, why should it matter if conversions do take place? Because if all religions are as good as the other, and if that is what the constitution wants, or says, or mandates, then whether I become a Buddhist, or whether so-and-so becomes a, a Christian, it makes no difference. It should make no difference, because every religion is as good as the other. It can only matter if religion is seen as a source of political power then it matters as to who is a Hindu and who is a Christian and who is uh, a follower of Islam. As early as 1994, it was noted by, Supreme Court, by the Supreme Court that the rise of fundamentalism and commun communalization of politics are anti-secularism. They encourage separatist and divisive forces and become breeding grounds for national disintegration and fail the parliamentary democratic system and the Constitution. Who then is responsible for keeping secularism and national integration alive? Where in a free, free play of social forces it is not possible to bring about a voluntary harmony, it is the state which has to step in to set right the imbalance between the competing interests. It is India's misfortune that although it was founded and meant to continue as a secular state, 
religion is seen as a source of political power and therefore colors governmental action. How can an Indian hope for neutrality in governance if the government is religiously prejudiced? Fortunately, the constitution is neutral. Although Article 14 says that the state shall not deny to any person equality before the law or the equal protection of the law within the territory of India, equal protection of the law does not mean that all persons must be dealt with identically, irrespective of the circumstances. That would be formal equality. For example, if I treat a child and an adult identically, I would not be treating the child equally. I would have to give some advantage to the child so that it can in fact compete with me or be on par with me. We, we do that every day. Uh, when the child sits at the table to eat, we give the child a higher chair so that it can eat equally with the rest of us. That is substantive equality. But the giving of that high chair is not appeasing the child. That is the child's right to be treated equally. Therefore, true or substantive equality requires that a distinction must be made having some relevance. When I make that distinction in favor of the child, by saying that yes, everyone in this house will have chairs of this height, but this child, because it is so small, will have a slightly higher uh, chair. It has relevance to the purpose for which the classification is made. The Constitution, therefore, similarly, makes special provisions for vulnerable sections of society, including minorities. This is not appeasement, but it means that it has provided for substantive equality as opposed to mere formal equality by creating a level playing field for the weaker sections so that they can live on par with all other Indians. Fundamental to the concept of equality before the law is that the task of superintending the operation of law rests with an impartial and an independent judiciary, independent, independent of all political coloring independent of any outside influence, but dependent only on the Constitution. The fact is that the framers of the Constitution did not define such concepts like equality, liberty, or freedom. They did not lay down the standards of reasonableness or the restrictions which the Constitution allows on the freedom of speech, the right of peaceable assembly to form associations, to move freely, reside and settle else anywhere. In, uh, uh, all these rights are subject to reasonable restrictions. Who decides what is reasonable? Who decides what is equality? Who decides what is freedom? Who decides what is public morality, what is public order, and what is health? It is left to the judges. The judges, in fact, now, since none of the rights have a fixed content, the, each generation of judge, judges has poured content into these empty vessels, if one can call them that, in the light of their judicial experience. The concepts of communal harmony and secularism have by and large been well protected by courts. Very recently, uh, not very recently, about 10 years ago, uh, the, uh, there was a, as a result of a communal clash, a woman had been very brutally murdered and uh, they had said that, you know, they argued that you know, the, the, the communal clash arose because there was provocation and so forth and therefore the death penalty should not be given. But the Supreme Court said no. In our country where the constitution guarantees to all individuals freedom of religious faith, thought, belief, and expression, and where no particular religion is accorded a superior status and none subjected to hostile discrimination, the commission of offenses motivated only by the fact that the victim professes a different religious faith cannot be treated with leniency. Judges need great wisdom and restraint in wielding this great judicial power. Otherwise, judges can, and sometimes, I must confess, though very rarely, 
had er erected their own personal perceptions into principles. Now, so therefore, it is the state, which, as I said, political judges, piecemeal decisions. Some people say that uh, it is the, the, the national integration and uh, communal harmony it really calls for introspection by the minorities into why is it that most of the incidents of terrorism uh, they found to be Muslims. So therefore, let the minority uh, community look within themselves to find a solution. But according to a very respected human uh, 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 judge of the Supreme Court, uh, Justice H.R. Khanna, which if you remember that during the time of emergency declared by Indira Gandhi, he was the only one who gave a dissenting opinion when emergency was imposed. And I agree with Justice Khanna. The major responsibility for ensuring communal amity in every country lies upon the majority community. It can indeed be said that the index of the level of civilization, culture, and Catholicity of a nation can be gauged from the fact as to how far its minorities feel secure and are not subjected to any discrimination or suppression. The same view has been expressed by noted economist, Mr. Urjun Shingupto, who said that communalism is a group phenomenon in the sense that if it reflects the attitude of one group towards another, individually, you find a person is perfectly nice to talk to, but as soon as that person gets into a group, they become communal. Now, when this group is adopted, this, uh, this is adopted by the majority community, according to uh, Dr. Sengupta, it can lead to fascism. Just as hatred of the Jews was a cementing factor in the ideology which justified ethnic cleansing and genocide in several countries in Europe, in our country, the objects of hatred could become the minorities, namely the Muslims and Christians. Uh, Christianity, if public perception of the majority is swayed. One lesson that the history of these sordid years in Europe teaches us is that if the growth of fascism is not resisted and fought at the very beginning, it inexorably engulfs the whole society in a few years. In conclusion, let me emphasize, there is no such thing as the Indian religion. None of the major religious religions in India are in that sense truly indigenous. Historically, the earliest inhabitants of India were pantheists, in other words, they worshipped nature, who believed in ancestral worship. Indeed, there are some tribal areas where this form of worship persists. The difference, therefore, between the various or the five main faiths major faiths in India is only one of history. Someone has come a little earlier, someone has come a little later, and the difference lies in numbers. That is all. The majority, merely because they are in the majority, cannot appropriate Indianness exclusively to themselves. They cannot say that you have to be an Indi Indian, you have to be Hindu, or have to live like Hindu. One does not have to belong to or live like the majority to be truly Indian. Religion must therefore be separated from nationality. One's belief is and should be irrelevant in assessing one's patriotism. Religion can only be relevant if India claims to be a theocratic state. It is not. Nothing can be justified in the name of freedom without actually giving people an opportunity to exercise that freedom. The violation of freedom can also come from the tyranny of conformism that may make it difficult for members of the community to opt, uh, opt for other styles of living. I would say it's a phrase that I have found and which I have used in one of my judgments, in which I dissent from the majority. I have said that India is not a melting pot where everything becomes one. Our uniqueness lies in that we are a silent bowl. Thank you.